This little crown jewel of a budget, named Monthly Budget, was built completely without touching the keyboard, no Terraform CLI was used by a human, and yet it was delivered in seconds. I'm gonna show you how I did that. This was done using the concept of continuous integration, or CI. It's where we take the lessons I've been talking about in earlier videos, where we write some code like in Terraform to define exactly what we want, but then we hand over that code to the continuous integration engine and say, it's your responsibility now. You go build this and maintain it and keep it working. I'm not gonna be doing this on my keyboard anymore. So let's take a look at the continuous integration setup and at the code to see how this was done. So it's time to build a budget. Let's look at the resource here. It's pretty straightforward. We're gonna build a budget. It's gonna be a monthly budget. And we're accepting a few variables for the budget amount, the threshold to notify, and the email address to send an email to if there's notification. Pretty simple. However, I have also split things up so that we have the actual resource we wanna build here in main.tf. The variables are defined here in, surprisingly, the variable.tf file. I will note there's nothing special about these names. As long as it's a .tf file, it's fine. It just helps for me when I see variable.tf, my brain goes, there's gotta be variables in there. So you can see the variables here. We need the budget amount, the threshold for notification, and an email address. And those are string, number, and list types of variables, respectively. I'm answering the question for what should be those values be here in the terraform.tf vars. So I'm saying a $500 budget, notify me if we exceed 100% of that. And my email address is user at example.com. And then we've got some other things here. We've got the actual instructions for the continuous integration system. This is just the instructions that tells the CI engine that we're using. And in this case, it's GitLab. Here's what to do. And we co-locate that with the code because it triggers based on where it's at and what the name is. In this case, .gitlab-ci.yaml is a special name that has to be located in the root of the project. Moving on, we've got a backend file, just simply telling it where to store state in the backend remote. And we have a git ignore file that makes sure that git is not looking in the .terraform folder, ignoring anything that's a tfvars file or tfstate file because I like to keep my repositories clean so that all is there is kind of the raw code and everything necessary to run CI. I've made a project in GitLab and we've included this CI file and I've gone ahead and pushed those changes to the GitLab project and don't worry, it's just regular git commands. You just do git push and things like that. Nothing's different because underneath the covers, they're all using git. So let's switch over to GitLab and see how that's configured. I've created a fun little environment for learning here. I've got my wall network group. That's kind of the organization that I've built out within GitLab to hold my projects. And we have one project called monthly budget. There it is. Let's click on it. See what's going on in here. <laughs> If you've ever used any kind of version control system like GitHub, GitLab looks pretty much the same. The idea is that we're syncing our changes from the local machine to this particular project. And there's all those files, the backend, the main, the provider, the variable, all that stuff is there. It's been synchronized and it's ready to rock. The difference is that GitLab CI YAML file. If we click into that, we'll see instructions that are sent to the GitLab environment. And you can see the first thing right at the top, this GitLab CI configuration is valid. That's because what GitLab does is it reads through this YAML file and it learns things such as what image are we gonna use when we're running jobs? What variables do we want to inject into those images that are called runners that are gonna supply information for environmental variables? Where do we wanna cache information that is stored between jobs? Uh, things like anchors and insertion points that are common to YAML. However, the real magic comes from the stages and what happens in those stages. And you can think of stages like you're progressing through a race course. You have to meet these different stages of the race course to get to the finish line. And there's rules as to how you approach each stage, what happens at each stage. They're all defined here in the CI YAML file. So first we actually have a stages section and that tells the CI process there's a validate stage, a plan stage, and an apply stage. And this is tightly coupled to kind of how Terraform views the world from a CI perspective. So within the validate stage, I have a few jobs that run. The first one's called validate because we're running a Terraform validate. And that's telling it, hey, you know what? Do this anytime you see a change to a .tf file or a subfile called .tf, go ahead and run a Terraform validate followed by a Terraform format. And if you find anything wrong with this, kind of halt things, because we have some issues. Also during the validate stage, I'm running a couple other jobs. One is called Checkoff, which is a great static security checker. It's gonna look at my code, and it's gonna make sure that I didn't do anything goofy where I'm exposing an S3 bucket or something like that. 
It's making sure that I'm secure from a code perspective. The third validate job is called tflint, and that's where I'm grabbing the tflint image, and that's looking at how I've written my Terraform code and validating that I'm not breaking any kind of best practices or recommendations. All of the validate jobs pretty much will run anytime the CI system sees new code, whether it's to a feature branch or with a merge request. The only thing that we've said specifically is don't run the validate stuff unless we see changes to a .tf file because there's no sense validating any changes if there's none made. Next, we have the plan stage, and I've broken this up into a test plan that gets run whenever there's a merge request, and a final plan that gets run whenever we've made a commit back to the main branch. The reason for this is if somebody proposes a merge request, I want to test what the plan is gonna look like and show myself, them, the rest of the team, this is what this change is going to do. Here's the plan without impacting production. The final plan happens when we actually commit to the main branch, meaning we want those changes to be done in production, and we need to build a plan file to hand over to Terraform so that it can apply those changes into production. Finally, there's the apply stage, and this will only trigger when changes have hit the main branch. So if you make a new branch or if you do a merge request, these jobs won't run because they're not triggered on those sorts of changes. The first job is called apply and it happens during the apply stage. And that's where we're actually going to apply the previously generated plan that's been created in the final plan job. Later, we have this kind of wait state where the destroy job is waiting to be triggered. That's a manual thing that can be done to tear down any changes in production. And I don't always have a destroyed job, but in this case, I wanna just have kind of that big red button I can push to tear everything down. And there's certain controls such as you have to be the right person with the right permissions and things like that. Not just anyone can go and destroy the environment. But you know, I find it kind of handy for demos or environments that I wanna commonly create destroy to have that big red button. But hey, let's take a look at the pipeline. Let's actually run it and see what's happening. And before I do that, I'm just gonna show you that I've gone ahead and removed the budget, so it's not there. So we should be able to watch it actually build the budget from scratch. So I'll hit run pipeline, and that will trigger all the jobs based on what's going on with the branch, and we'll be good to go. So here we have the pipeline running, and you can see the validate, plan, and apply stages. And each one of those little wheels shows that the jobs are in progress. And we can click any one of those. We can see what they're doing, if they're running, what's going on with them. In this case, the job that's going to perform the validation has not started yet, but we're gone ahead and said, go grab me a runner, get this particular version of the HashiCorp Terraform image and run that. And boom, it's pretty much done already. It's gone and checked out the code from the project, loaded it into the image that we have running for this particular environment. It's a Terraform image and it's running the commands that we said, the Terraform validate and the Terraform format. Everything came back successful, and so the job passed along a success code to the rest of the pipeline. Now, in the time it's taking me just to tab back, we can see that the checkoff security test, the tflint linting test, and the validation have all passed, so every job within validate is done and passed. Therefore, it proceeded to the planning milestone, where we can see we generated the final plan, and now we're in the apply stage, and if I go into the apply job, we can see everything's actually already done. The code's been handed over to the job, and you can see down here, we went ahead and created that budget, and if I go back to the billing section, we should be able to see that right now. And boom, there's the budget. So that's the idea, right? Instead of doing this at the keyboard and manually loading the security checkers and linters and things like that and building a plan and doing all this at my laptop, I'm able to hand it over to a CI engine and I get a consistent experience every time. All of those checks have to be performed. The pipeline requires them. It's done by a machine instead of by a person, so it's done consistently every single time. But you might be wondering, how does it know what to assign the values of the budget? Like, where is it getting this information from? Well, that's where the concept of variables come in. And variables can be assigned anywhere you want within the CI system. They're all gonna be a little bit different. But for this scenario, what I've done is I've supplied the budget amount, the email address, and the notification threshold directly in the project as project level variables. And I can reveal those and you'll see there's the $500, there's the user example.com for our email address stored as a list of email addresses, and the notification threshold of 100%. Now, to be fair, this is just one way to do it. You would probably want in a more robust, larger environment to have a secrets vault of some sort that you're referring to. But really the point is don't put the variables in the code. Don't store the information about what to do in the actual code itself. That's hard coding those variables and it makes it difficult to work with. Insert the variables or the secrets elsewhere that's kind of abstracted from the code 
to keep it stateless. Now, if you have a really keen eye or a curious noodle, you might think, well, how does it know how to interact with Amazon? Where is it getting the credentials? And how does it have access to store the state in Terraform Cloud? Well, that's where the concept of group variables come in with GitLab CI. I've supplied the Amazon access key and secret key along with the token for Terraform Cloud in the wall network group so that any project I create within this group can access those pieces of information and use them for authentication into those systems. Well, pause for just a moment. I just wanna say thanks for watching the video. It means a lot to me. If you could take five seconds out of your time, click like, subscribe to the channel, and optionally turn on notifications, I'd really appreciate it. It super helps this channel grow. Making changes is the real power of continuous integration. It makes changing things really easy and fairly low risk. So in this case, I'm looking at the AWS provider for Terraform. The latest version is 3.13. I probably wanna use that, but first I wanna see what it's gonna do. So let's go over to the code and make that change. I'm gonna go into the provider code and say, make sure that it's 3.13 or greater. And that way we're ensuring that it's not gonna accidentally try to use some older code like 3.12 or the 3.3 that we had specified there. We're gonna be guaranteeing at least 3.13, if not something greater. And let's make another change. Let's think about going to the variable section and maybe you have a style guide and someone's a real stickler for putting periods at the ends of the descriptions to make it a fancy sentence, something like that. Let's add these changes, but we, we don't want to do that to the main branch. That's kind of a, a no-no. We want to put it in a feature branch. So let's check out a new branch. Git checkout branch. We'll call it like and subscribe because that meme will never die. <laughs> so now we have a new branch. We'll add all those changes. I have a little shortcut that adds everything there. And then we'll commit that. So we'll do a commit of proper variable names and new AWS version, something like that. Cool. So let's push this up to the project, boom. And that will trigger a new, the creation of a new branch. And GitLab's pretty cool, look at that. It says, oh, you can merge this request by clicking this link if you want. So let's go ahead and click that link and see what is going on in the repo as we make these changes. Before I actually make this merge request, let's just take a look and see what the CI system is doing with this project. The only thing that we've done so far is we've presented a new branch. And you can see there's already a pipeline running. What do you think it's doing? Well, let's take a look. You can see that it's running all the jobs in the validate stage. That's because there's a new branch shown up. There's new code. And we told the CI pipeline, go ahead and run the validate stage anytime you see new code and changes to .tf files. So as the engineer working with this code, I can already see I don't have any issues with the security, the linting, or the validation of that code. I can feel good about doing my merge request. So I'm gonna go back over to the merge request. We're gonna accept the merge request here, submit it to the system to be reviewed. And this will trigger more pipelines because now we've gone beyond just presenting a branch. We're also presenting a merge request. So we'll go back to the pipelines and we should have a whole new set of pipelines running. There we go. You can see this pipeline is running something a little bit different. If we click into that, we should be able to see what's going on. We have the test plan. Now, if you remember, the test plan runs whenever we have a merge request. That's what we told the CI system to do. And we don't need to do the other validation stage because that's already done because this merge request is based on the commits that have already been made to that branch. We've already tested it. So we can skip that and just do a test plan. Now the test plan is just gonna run a Terraform plan. You can see it right down here. It's gonna run the Terraform plan using the variable information that we have stored in the project for the email address, notification threshold, and the budget. And look, it tells us right here, this is what's gonna happen. We already have a deployment of this budget. And so in this case, it's just gonna change the limit amount from 500.0 to 500, just little inconsistencies in the API. So that's fine, I don't see a problem with that. Nothing's breaking, no issues with the provider that I'm using. So we can feel pretty confident this change will be successful. Additionally, if I look at the merge request, I can see a lot of information such as what actual branch I'm trying to commit. So I'm going from like and subscribe into main. We can see the pipeline, so we can go to the pipeline for that particular commit. I can approve it if I just wanna show my team like, yeah, this is good, I like it. And all the information I need to understand what Terraform would do is right here. We can see that a plan was generated, there's gonna be one change. I can view the log to see all the different changes that are gonna happen. And ultimately, I can now choose to merge this request. So we'll go in and say, great, merge it, get rid of the source branch because I don't need that anymore. And this will trigger the final pipeline. We can see the pipelines running, so I can see that right there, kind of in order, like I'm reading a story, 
And if I click on this pipeline, we'll see that last pipeline where we're gonna apply the changes into production. Now, because we're doing a commit into production, I make the pipeline do all the things because we're seeing new commits into the main branch. We're seeing changes to the .tf files. So we're gonna go through all the validate job. We're gonna build that final plan and we're gonna hand that over to the apply job so that it can take that plan and actually make it reality into production. If anything breaks along the way, I want it to stop. That's why we go through the validate and everything just to make sure for a sense of sanity that nothing's gonna break or be harmed by this production push. Just like we saw earlier with the apply job when we created the budget from scratch, here we're applying changes. So the change that you see is a modification and those modifications took a second because we're changing 500 to 500.0 or something like that. But all the information is here. You can get the logs out of it. All that kind of jazz is viewable, but we never had to put fingers to a keyboard and actually interact with Terraform or the cloud. The last thing I want to show you is the state files. Now, if you remember with Terraform, there's always a state file and it's super important. You have to have a state file. And so I'm using Terraform Cloud as my remote backend and you can see all the state files as we go through the process so that you understand what's going on from a CI perspective to plan and build things in the cloud, as well as the state files as they get iterated upon as we run more pipelines. And here it is. You can see when we actually first built the budget recently, it was 22 minutes ago, the new state file was triggered. This is building the budget from scratch. And then 15 minutes, we made some modifications to the budget and so on and so forth. And each version of the state file will exist in Terraform Cloud for me to refer to or potentially do some troubleshooting with in the future. The last thing I'm gonna cover is environments, and this is a representation of the resources we built in the cloud. This production environment represents that we're running this resource in the cloud, and in this case, it's a budget. So if I click the stop button here, it'll go and stop the environment and run whatever code is required during the stopping process. Now for us, that means actually going in and running a pipeline to destroy the environment. You can see here that last pipeline that we built to build everything, we have a new job being run in the apply stage, and that's the destroy job. And if we click into the destroy job, we can see that it's gonna go ahead and execute a Terraform destroy and get rid of everything that's in the cloud environment. Boom, destroyed, we killed the budget, it's gone, and we've updated the state to reflect that. So if I go back to the budget console and we refresh the screen, there will no longer be a monthly budget. That's the power of continuous integration and running your infrastructure as code using something like GitLab CI. It allows you to just kind of explore new ideas, to throw them into an environment where they're always gonna be consistently checked and secured and linted and planned. Your team can then look and see your idea. You can talk about them in real time. And then once you feel comfortable and your team feels comfortable, push that code into production and don't worry about it anymore. Just go to the next thing that you have to do. It makes dealing with the daily operations of even really complex and wide spanning environments pretty straightforward and oftentimes pretty simple. I hope this has inspired you to check out GitLab CI or at least explore the concepts of continuous integration further. And if you've not checked it out already, I have a great blog called The Fundamentals of Continuous Integration that I'll link to here that should get you started with all the concepts that I've covered in this video in a little bit greater detail. Until then, happy terraforming using continuous integration.